Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. Hope y'all are having a good start to your week. Let's all go and stand. Turn to page number two. Number two. Savior died down where from cleansing from sin I cried there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied glory So sweetly abides within there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, Precious fountain that saves from sin. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. To his name. There to my heart was the blood of Thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. My heart was the blood applied. Glory Fifty-six. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace in the mansions bright and blessed. Oh 
81. 81. Times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever. trials will seem so small when we see Christ one glimpse of his dear face all sorrow will erase so bravely run the race till we see Christ sometimes the sky looks dark missionary report from the Rismondo family, Chris Rismondo in Malawi and his family. Hello praying friends and supporters. Since Malawi is part of the Commonwealth, we get information on the country from the equivalent of the United Kingdom's Department of State. Things are touch and go on the ground in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Malawi has limited opening of the airport, also if eligible for entry, and you come in, you have to be tested depending on results, be quarantined or self-isolated for days 
all at your own expense or even forced treatment. So it's trying to shorten this down. He says, uh, Chris said, they have been in contact with immigration officials in Malawi as well as locals. We have been able to begin the paperwork for our next TEP. I don't know what TEP stands for, so <laughs> some kind of permit. Although much of the process has changed due to the new president, as well as the virus instigated changes, I do not believe any of this will keep us from coming back soon and continuing with the ministry of the gospel. It will simply make it a little more difficult. So it's good to hear that. Despite the government issues, they would have been on their way back, but Chris had some issues with his health and he's getting tested for. They have had to return for his health issues and to pick up some extra needed support they also found some growth in his lungs and caused some alarm. So he's scheduled for a repeat scan in mid-October, Lord willing. These problems can be handled quickly within the next few weeks, at which time we will return. Chris has had many opportunities for preaching and teaching in the last couple of months since they've been here. Also continue to be involved with the saints in Malawi, the Bible-believing churches we're involved in, with, including his own are doing okay, some better than others. In Christ Jesus, the Chris Rismondo family. So for Chris, Hannah, Amelia, Marissa, Savannah, Christine, Joseph, and Zacharias. So pray for Chris's health, their continued extra support, their soon return to Malawi, the churches in Malawi, and souls to be saved. And also, please also pray for the local missionary work here of our public ministry to grow and continue serving the Lord. Robert, Joe, and Anissa, Ismael, and Joss's family, as well as uh, David and Michelle and many others, uh, please pray for the continued service to our Lord Jesus Christ in that. And it reminds me real quickly that uh, some of you have been to Ken Ham's Ark and uh, their museum or different things. Some of you watched some videos on it in Ken Ham, but I'll never forget hearing him preach once several years back and. He came here in the early 80s as a missionary to America. So we, like others, need missionaries. There's lots of lost folks to so pray for that as well. And let's pray now, Lord. We thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Christmas Mondo family, for all the family, and pray for his healing and the tests go well and their much needed support that they can soon return and continue ministering there for the lost souls in Malawi and the church in Malawi. We pray for all those. And on the local front here, the missionaries at work here in public ministry, that you continue growing that work and uh, for the love of lost souls, that we would be serving you and serving our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Brother Brian? All right, good morning. How y'all doing? Good. I got a couple shirts up here. I'll give you the lowdown on these shirts. Um, there's pink, there's blue, there's also green and red. But these shirts were donated to us and they all say Jesus saves on them. And they're ranging sizes from small to uh, 3X. And they are free. Um, they're on the table over there in the fellowship hall. And if you would like one, just go over to the fellowship hall and pick one up. But these are, these are free t-shirts. And uh, again, small to the 3X. And there's pink, blue, red, and green. And they are free. So you are welcome to the shirts. Care of some generous donations there. <laughs> that, that would definitely that would definitely be more fun. <laughs> so, you know, it's one thing to shoot them in the air, but if I shoot them like directly at y'all, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. I like that. All right, the, so, the shirts are free. We're not going to shoot them at you or anything. Um, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Uh, another thing that's, that's neat that's going on, Children's Church, we're going to expand Children's Church a little bit. So we're going to go up through sixth grade, and then we're going to divide the, the little kids from the bigger kids. 
we got two two uh, different um, you know groups and sets of teachers there. So children's church right now goes to third grade. Now it's going to go up to sixth grade, and that's going to start in November. So not next week, but. Uh, be praying about that if you would like to participate in that, if you would like to help. We do need some volunteers to, to help, um, or we will in the future, but uh, if you would like to participate, I don't, I don't think I, I, I ask y'all, I have asked y'all that before, but if you'd like to participate in Children's Church um, as a volunteer, if you're that bold and would like to do that, then, <laughs> then let me know, and uh, we'll get you, get you hooked up with the teachers over there, but uh, that's that's neat. It's going to grow a little bit. We're going to have uh, an opportunity for some older kids and some younger kids, but it's going to go up through sixth grade. Sixth grade. Um, let's see a couple other things. Public ministry, like Alan talked about Thursday, ten thirty a.m. in Kennedy, and I'm I'm looking at in November, along with starting or increasing children's church, but also getting back on the um, schedule for Sunday, door knocking, things like that, or at least uh, at least getting the, the door hangers out. These are the door hangers. We've got some up here. We've got some in a box over there. But these are a great way to just get the gospel out, get an opportunity to, to tell folks where they can come to hear the gospel and uh, try to magnify Jesus Christ in our community. And if you would like to just take some door hangers, you're free to take them. Just, just take some. Please just take ones that you'll use and uh, get them out and all that kind of thing. So uh, public ministry this Thursday for sure. We're looking at putting it back on the calendar come November. Uh, next week I'll have for the finance. We haven't had like a, a church finance meeting in a while. But next week I've got the first three quarters printed out, which I will give to you guys Probably in the morning because most of you all will be here. And we may have a, a brief financial, just if you got any questions about it in the evening or something like that. But uh, I definitely have the printout of, of the first three quarters of the this year done. And I'll just tell you, it's good. I mean, a lot of considering what, what everybody's been through this year, it's we're, the Lord has taken care of us. And so uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to, to know that and to have that happen. Um, but he's taking care of us through you guys. Y'all, he uses, I heard a preacher say, uh, uh, I have good news and I have bad news. All the money to take care of the church is here. The bad news is it's in your pocket. And so, <laughs> so anyhow, but the Lord's taking care of us through you, you guys. Generous donations. And uh, I'll have those printouts next week and give them out in the morning um, so you can see them. And like I said, we'll probably, probably have a little meeting after church in the evening time. And um, this, this last thing, we, we now have Internet in both the buildings. We've got that done. And we're looking at upgrading our video setup so we're not just using a phone each time, you know, and uh, so anyhow, if you guys have any expertise in technology, and uh, we don't want to, I don't want to upgrade to something that's cheaper than what we have, I mean, you want to do something that's nice and something that's going to stay a while, and so uh, anyhow, if you guys have expertise in that, I've got some, uh, Brother Gene Sharp, he gave us some advice about all of it, and he does this stuff as He's done it for years and set up churches with the internet and radio stations for years. Um, but uh, uh, he gave us some advice on some things, gave me some cameras and just stuff to look at, some equipment to look at. So be praying about that. And like I said, I'm opening this up to you guys as if you have expertise in this and you can give some, uh, some thoughts on it. So uh, anyhow, we're kind of in a position now we can do a little bit more. So. Those are the announcements, and I think that's all the announcements. Have a couple men come forward, and we will take up the offering this morning.
Pray again that you pray for us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord, to worship you. Lord, to tell you we love you. And Lord, just thank you for sending your son, Lord, to die on that cross, Lord. Amen. God, uh, we just pray you bless the service this morning and guide and direct. And Lord, we hear about these missionary letters every Sunday morning, God. Uh, uh, so many of these missionaries are, are not on the field, Lord. I know that's where their heart is. I know that's where the desire is to be. I pray if you're true will, Lord, you would get these uh, family, these men and their families back on the field. And God, uh, just bless them. And, and uh, Lord, I, I know that uh, no matter, you know, the, the harvest is, is there, Lord, no matter where we are. And these men's hearts are, are there. Amen. And uh, Lord, I pray you would uh, you bless them and get them back. And Lord, uh, you know, for us local here, you know, we have a missionary uh, field here available to all of us everywhere we go and the people we talk to. Amen. You would leave it on our, keep it on our hearts, Lord, and, and Lord, that we would, uh, when the opportunity arises, Lord, we would be able to witness and, and uh, tell others about you. God, I pray you bless us this morning, guide and direct, and Lord, just uh, open our ears and soften our hearts this morning to, for your word. And I pray that you would uh, continue to bless, thank you for blessing us this year, and Lord, uh, taking care of us financially. Amen. I pray that you would continue to guide and direct. All these things are God's glory and prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. First Samuel chapter number eight. First Samuel eight. I gotta say, studying this chapter, I I did not think uh, this was as pivotal a chapter in the Bible as as, as it turns out it is. Um, history is made up of people's decisions. Uh, people in influence and their decisions, and it's made up of uh, sometimes God's input into man's decisions. But uh, uh, this chapter that we're gonna we're gonna look at, Israel rejects their heavenly king, and I I don't think personally reading this chapter, I don't think. God ever intended for anyone to be king of Israel except Jesus Christ. But Israel wanted a king. And I, I guess the theme you could say in this chapter is just be careful what you ask for. Um, <laughs> sometimes the solution to what we think the solution to our problem is, as they say, it puts us out of the frying pan and into the fire. And uh, Israel wants a visible head on earth that they can look to because every other nation has that. And they just, it would just make them feel more secure if they had it. Samuel protests and God protests against it. But the Lord ultimately says, give them, give them what they're asking for. And uh, they're, they're going to come to regret it, unfortunately, but go ahead and give them what they're asking for. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 8, be careful what you ask for. Here it is. 1 Samuel chapter 8, it came to pass, verse 1, when Samuel was old, 
that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. There it is. There's the heavenly king. He's not visible on the earth yet. This is 1,100 years before Jesus Christ is born. But uh, this, this is the voice of the Lord from heaven, and he is the heavenly king of Israel at this time and uh, ruling from heaven. Verse 8, According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt... Even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit, yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him of a king, ask of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots. To be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and he will set them to ear his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And he will take your fields, and your vineyards, and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. Notice, notice this, he will take and he says it multiple times, he will take, he will take, he will take, and he will appoint his. And he'll make him his, and he'll make him his. He will take, verse 15, uh, the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, <laughs> that you chose this man. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Wow. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. That, that's kind of the idea. We, we want somebody that will do this for us. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. Let's pray and we'll talk about Israel's rejected king. Father, I pray you'd help us this morning. I pray you'd feed your flock. I pray that you would... Give us an understanding of these verses. This is an absolutely pivotal chapter in the Bible. And history in Israel forever changes on the answered prayer here, unfortunately. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us make the application in our own lives, that you would make the application. Um, and uh, you would enlighten us the way we need to be enlightened. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, there is, there's, there's four things in this chapter that uh, it, it's really, that are absolutely pivotal, or really one big element that's pivotal in Israel's history. And like I said before, I don't believe, I don't believe God intended for anyone else to ever be king over Israel than Jesus Christ. And the way I get to that conclusion is this chapter here. God intended that the government he set up in Israel where Jesus Christ reigned from heaven, so to speak. I mean, he is, he's the Lord in heaven. 
would reign over Israel and not be a visible head until he became a man, died for the sins of the whole world, resurrected, and eventually came in, the, in his glo- glory. That would, that would be the, the culmination, that would be the ultimate, and that would be the, the king of Israel who is also the king of kings. But Israel thinks they need a king. They need a visible head like all other nations, someone who will go fight their battles, someone who, who will put them in a position. And, and ultimately, they, this is what the nation believes, that conformity to the world is strength. We want to be like the other nations. They say that a couple times. We want to be like the other nations. We want a visible figurehead for our country that we can look to, that other nations can look to, and by conforming our government to the governments of the world, that will give us strength and influence. And, and you see, when, when Israel looks and, and asks for this, uh, the Lord protests it, and Samuel gets, gets mad about it. Uh, there, there are, here's, here's the idea, here's the idea. This is, this history, just a little history here, this is 1,100 years before Jesus Christ is born. Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews. It's, it's said when he's born, he, here's the King of the Jews. Where is he that's born King of the Jews? Where is he at? That's what Herod asks. And before he's the King of the Jews, and before he's even born, Jesus Christ is the Lord in heaven who shepherds the nation, who gives revelation to Moses on Mount Sinai, who leads the nation out of Egypt, births the nation through the, through the, the, the Red Sea, gives them revelation on how to conduct their business in the promised land, and he guides them from heaven. And he gives them information and he guides them from heaven Ultimately, he will become a man and all that kind of stuff. You get the idea, I think. But for, first, he's a heavenly king. He's in heaven. And he has been guiding the nation of Israel or trying to guide the nation of Israel for, at this point, almost 400 years. And, and so now Israel's to a point where they, they, they don't like the way they're being governed with this invisible head, so to speak. And so you, you've, we've read the, the account here. They asked for a king. But the first point in, in all of this is, is, as it relates to us and as it relates to the text here, the, the first thing you notice in this chapter is Samuel's own children are kind of messing up in their job. And the, Samuel has, has these boys. He appoints them judges. And they don't do good at their job. They, they do not have the same convictions their dad had. They don't, they don't have the same character their dad had. And so they take over as judges, and Samuel's kind of getting older. These boys take over as judges, and they take bribes, they pervert judgment, they run after money, wherever the money is, that's where the judgment goes. And the people, here's the, here's the point, the people seem to have a legitimate complaint. They say, look, the, the people you've appointed over us are not doing a good job. Now, let, let me address, before we get into that, let me address this. Samuel's a good man. He has children who apparently aren't good men. And the difference, there is a difference between the way the Lord handles Samuel and his children and the way the Lord handled Eli and his children. When it came to Eli's children, the Lord said, your children and their problem is you, Eli. You're the dad and you did not address things that needed to be addressed. You let it go and now we come to this point where it's all corrupt. However, when Samuel has children that do this, the Lord doesn't say the same things about Samuel. That's kind of interesting. And so it's not, I guess it's interesting in the fact that just because children 
go astray, that doesn't mean it was mom and dad's fault. But sometimes it does mean that. (laughs) Sometimes it does mean that. Sometimes it means mom and dad had a hand in making them go astray. But on other cases, mom and dad did everything they could to keep them right. And they still went astray. Ultimately, ultimately, people are individuals and they're going to make their own decisions. But that's not an excuse not to be a parent. It's not an excuse to just say, well, they're going to make their own decisions, so I'm not going to... I'm not going to push, push my beliefs on them or, or whatever. You're a parent. You're supposed to have lived life and be able to impart some wisdom to them. So anyhow, back to, back to Samuel's children. They, they, they're, they're crooked, unfortunately, but the Lord doesn't, he doesn't cite Samuel like he did Eli. The people of Israel, they, they, they're they're reason for uh, looking for a king is and they have an excuse I mean they have a it looks like a legitimate reason but here's here's what it boils down to it boils down to this just just because the system that God put in place isn't functioning properly just because the system the government that God put in place isn't functioning properly in Israel that doesn't mean you just blow up the whole system Oftentimes, it's, it's limited to the people who aren't doing their job. Not necessarily the system, it's the people who are involved that are corrupt. Ultimately, the people make up the system. And so, just because the people aren't doing the job they're supposed to be doing, that doesn't mean you just destroy the whole thing, which is Israel's suggestion. Well, these guys aren't doing their job, so what, let's just... Ditch this whole idea of a heavenly king. Give us a king we can look at. Give us a king we, we, can, we can relate to. Give us a king we can see and that other nations can see. So that their idea is just blow up the whole system and give us a king. Well, that, that's not really the right answer either. The right answer would be the people who are corrupt in the system ought to stop being corrupt. Just, just because parents mess up in their job or children mess up being children or Bosses mess up being bosses or employees mess up being employees doesn't mean you, you just destroy the whole thing. Parenthood is a good thing. Work is a good thing. You don't just blow the whole thing up because some people don't do their jobs right. But that's Israel's idea. They, they have an excuse to reject their heavenly king. Um, and like I said, people's solutions, our, our solutions to problems often lead to just this out of, the, out of the frying pan and into the fire situation. You go from one problem that you, you are just, you're just desperate to get an answer. You're desperate, and God doesn't seem to, to, to be saying anything, and you're just desperate, so, so, so desperate, you go and do something stupider, and you make the thing worse. Well, that's, that's Israel. Give us a king. Our, our solutions are, are, are often <laughs> misguided, and uh, like I said, just be careful what you ask for. So Israel's leadership, they propose a completely different style of government that reflects other nations. That's the, that, their main point, Israel's main point in this, is if we can be like other nations, conformity to the world, if we can be like other nations, we will be a more powerful nation. If we will have a king like other nations have, it will, it will make us a more influential and powerful nation. That, that's their goal is conformity. And as you know, as you know, in the New Testament, Paul says, conform, don't be not conformed to this world. The, the, the weakness is in the conformity. The weakness is in the world. So they have, going back to this, Israel has this excuse. Samuel's kids aren't doing what they're supposed to do, so let's just forget the whole government God set up and let's do something different. Let's do something more like the world does it. And that's oftentimes, I think, individually, that's our solution too. We, we get caught in a bind. We want God to do something. He, he doesn't seem to answer. doesn't seem to answer and so we look around the world, well, what's the world's solutions? Let's just do that. Maybe that'll help us. 
And it turns out it doesn't. It doesn't help at all. So then the Lord explains it in verse, verses 6 through 9. He says, Samuel, they, they haven't, Israel hasn't rejected, they, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. The heavenly king has been rejected. So he says this, verse 6, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Israel's king has been reigning over Israel, or at least doing the the best job that I guess I'm dealing with people for 400 years from heaven. Now Israel has no desire to hear any more instruction from the God of heaven. They want to have a king that will give them instruction. And so God just explains to Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me because they don't want me to, to be over them. They don't want me telling them what to do anymore. And that, that, that's how I mean, we are with the Bible sometimes and with the Lord. And Paul even mentions it and, and says it in, in the book of Timothy where he says there, there comes a time where people just don't endure sound doctrine. They just don't want to be told how to live their life anymore. Whether, whether it's they don't like the person saying it or they don't like uh, the instruction itself. They just don't want to be told how to live their lives. And Paul says there's going to come a time where they don't endure sound doctrine. They just don't want to be told it and they're not going to be told. They're just not going to, they're not going to address the things in their life that they, I'm telling them to address. Well, that's Israel. They're not enduring sound doctrine. They don't want to hear anything from God. They want a king that's going to tell them what to do. So the Lord just explains it. Um, But he says this in all this. He says in verse 9, Therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Now, let me ask you a a probing question in this. Does this sound like this is God's will in this nation? What's about to happen? No. This is not what God wants for the nation. But God's willing to give them an answer. God's God's willing to say, look, Samuel, protest. Even give them the evidence. Tell them this is what's going to happen to your country if you do this. Just, Just lay it out for them. And if they still want it, I'm going to give it to them. I'll give them exactly what they're asking for. But this isn't on God's plan. This isn't what he wants for the nation. This isn't, this isn't one where he wants the nation to go. And that's why I say in this chapter, you have history forever changed in Israel. Forever changed. Yes, David's going to be a good king. There'll be some good ones that show up. But ultimately, it's just God's grace that he would pick a good man to show up on the throne. His whole, whole plan, I think, from the beginning was Jesus Christ will be the king on the throne, period. But when Israel says, give us a king, okay, protest to him. Tell him what's going to happen. But in the end, if they, if they still want a king, I'll give them a king. Then in verse 10, this earthly king is... <laughs> He is spelled out, and we mentioned it earlier, but notice all the he will. He, he will take your sons, in verse 11, and appoint them for himself. This is what this earthly king is going to do. Verse 12, and he will appoint him captains uh, over, 50, over thousands and captains over fifties, and he will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. So, so Samuel just lay, lays out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Samuel says, you're asking for a king? This king is just going to be a man, ultimately. And what he's going to do is he will take and he will make something for himself. He will take it from you and he will make it for himself. He's going to take this from you, and he's going to make this for himself. He's going to take this from you. He's going to make this for himself. He's going to take this from you. He's going to make this for himself. He's going to take this from you. He's going to make this for himself. 
And you know what Israel says after they hear all of that? Go ahead. We'll, we'll take it. We'll take it. That, that, that's fine with us as long as we can have a visible king. Just, just make us a visible king. And that is often, oftentimes, how we handle sin. You know what we do? We, we put out the... the, the uh, um, we weigh things out. We, we say, well, is it worth it to do this? Is it worth it to do this? Is it worth it to do this? And at the end of the day, if we want to do this particular sin with all the mounting evidence against it, we'll just say, you know what? It's worth it. It's fine. Just, just as long as I can get my way in this, it's fine. I don't really care about the consequences. I, I don't care how this turns out. I, I don't care how this is going to uh, affect me in the future. All I want right now, all I want right now is my will to be done right now. The future doesn't matter. Any of, any of that, it doesn't matter. So Samuel lays out, <clears throat> he lays out this whole thing. He says he's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to make them his, he's going to make this, he's going to make this his, 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 he's going to make this his. And the people say, that's fine, that's fine, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that, we'll accept that. And then Samuel comes back and says, there's going to come a time where you won't accept that. And you're going to cry out to God, and here's going to be the problem. When you cry out at that time, after you've accepted these consequences, when you cry out, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I won't listen. <clears throat> verse 19. Well, look in verse 18. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you. In that day, I, I, I think it's kind of, it's peculiar. The Lord listens to this request. Give us a king. He protests the request and he says, tell him, Samuel, what's, what's going to happen. And then goes ahead and answers that prayer. He's going to give him a king in the next chapter. Ultimately, they're going to have a king that they really don't want when this is all over. But the Lord answers that prayer, and as a caveat to answer in that prayer, he says, by the way, the next time you pray, I'm not answering it. I'm going to give you this thing. By the way, the next time you call on me, I'm not going to hear you. So be careful what you ask for. When, when I've laid out all of, all of the, the problems that are going to be associated with this answer, and you still say yes, give us this answer, just remember, I'm going to answer yes to this, and when you cry out to me again, I'm not going to hear it. So he answers one prayer with the caveat that, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to answer another one. Verse 19, here's ultimately... Uh, Israel will be endangered through their conformity to another, other nations. He says, nevertheless, verse 19, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, nay, but we will have a king over us. That we may also may be like all the nations. That's, that's the idea. And that our king may judge us. And go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. You know what I think Samuel understood at this point? When God answers this prayer, this nation is forever changed. You're going to get a king. Eventually, you're not going to like who's in power. But, but the whole reason you asked for this king is because you didn't like God's instruction. You didn't like the way God handled his business with your nation. You didn't like the way God was governing you as a people. And so, yeah, you got tired of that. But instead of 
maybe enduring, maybe having patience, maybe turning to the Lord. You decided, I'm, we, we just want the whole system changed. Just, just change the whole thing. And I imagine Samuel, the, the reason he protests vehemently at first is he knows if, when, if and when God answers this prayer and gives them a king, they will forever regret this. And so he, <laughs> the Lord says, give him a king. And Samuel says, right, you guys can go home now. God's going to give you a king. But I imagine Samuel, know, he knows exactly what, what's going to happen with this country. But their thought, Israel's thought, the nation thought, if we can be more like other nations, it'll give us power. It'll give us influence. It'll give us military strength. That's what they said. We'll go out and fight our battles. It'll give us military strength. It, it, it'll give us a great economic system. Just, just give us a king. Just change the way you're doing things. And the Lord's going to answer it. And that's why I said I said it from the beginning. And I, I really believe this is, is an absolutely pivotal chapter in the entire Bible. Because from this point on, Israel's government has changed in a way that's not going to be good for Israel. Yeah, there'll be some good kings show up. Only because of God's grace. But ultimately, God said, you have, in this request, you have rejected me. You don't want my authority. You don't want me reigning over you the way I am. And verse, verse 7 really sums the whole thing up. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. You get the idea? Here's, here's the king of heaven. Here, here is Jesus Christ 1,100 years before he shows up as a man. He has been shepherding the nation giving direction, giving direction, trying to gather the nation together, trying to, 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 to bless the nation, trying to keep them out of sin. He's been trying to help them, and for 400 years, giving them light through prophets and preachers and giving them light. And now that they come to a point where we're not interested in your light anymore. Just give us, give us somebody we can see and put them on a throne. Give, give, give us somebody that, that'll make our, make our economy great, that, that'll make our military great, that'll, that'll make us a, a, in, into, a, into a nation just like the other nations. And the Lord says, as we've seen it before here, he says, okay, well, I'll give you a king, but I'm not answering another request after this. When you cry out because you don't like the man in charge, I'm not, I'm not answering that one. I'll answer this one. And we'll, we'll, we'll change the whole system according to what you want. But once we change it, they're not changing back. And so Israel rejects God as a king. They uh, jump, like we said, out of the frying pan into the fire they ask for something they're going to regret, and it looks like, I mean, at the beginning, they had a reason to do it. It looks like at the beginning, hey, this, this, this could be a solution. This, this may be what we need to do, but ultimately, it was rejection of the Lord, and it was rejection of God's authority. God's direction, God's promises, God's blessings. And so the next chapter, Saul's going to be picked. He'll be king. And he'll, he'll be all right for a year. And then not all right for 39 years. David will be king. And David will be mostly good. He'll be a good king. He'll have a couple hiccups to say the least. And then and they'll go through several other kings. And then the nation will split. Ultimately, the only king that's going to be the right king for the nation of Israel is Jesus Christ. But at this point in Israel's history, they reject the authority of Jesus Christ. They reject their heavenly king. And just like the Lord says, they've rejected me, not you.
So a few points in all this, just to recap. There was an excuse. There was an excuse that Israel had, and it seemed legitimate. The people that are, that are currently in charge are no good, and so they get frustrated with that situation. Give us somebody else. Give us a whole, whole new setup, in fact. Just, just change the way you're doing business, Lord. Just change the whole way you're doing business. They had an excuse. The Lord explains exactly what's going on. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And then Samuel lays out all of what this king and these kings will ultimately do to the nation. And the people say, with all of that in mind, with all of that laid out, the people say, nah, we'd rather be like other nations. And the Lord gives them exactly what they want. So here's the, here's the simple theme of the whole chapter that can apply to you and me. Just be careful what you ask for. Just be careful what you ask for. As far as uh, making decisions on the fly or making decisions that uh, are based on pressure, things like that, be careful what you ask for. Oftentimes, oftentimes, I think, we get some pressure and make decisions that we shouldn't make that are regrettable decisions. But at the time, it seems like, you know what, we just need to change. We just need to ch- change the circumstances instead of maybe enduring the circumstances, instead of maybe just allowing things to happen the way they're going to happen. But if the Lord set something up like he did in Israel, that's the way he set it up. You don't need to change the setup. I'll, I'll give you a last illustration in all this. Here we are as a congregation. We're church. Come together and uh, open the Bible, read, pray, come on here Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday evening, things like that. Through all of this pandemic and stuff, you know what the pressure has been? To just completely blow up the way things have been going or, or completely blow up the system. Just change it. Completely change it. Maybe, maybe the mission of the church has changed. Maybe we got to, we got to, we got to, uh, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, I look around and you look around too and you see empty places where people were. And, and it, it, it has changed people's thinking it has changed people's hearts and i would say overall not changed for the better people people more people aren't serving god now what's happened is less people are serving god you know what, what that came from pressure changes in society changes from government regulations and you know what happened I think some people have made decisions in their lives that will affect the rest of their lives now. Not for the better, though. Not for the better. But they got to a position that it looked, it looked like this is excusable. We have to do something different. That's where Israel was. We got to do something different. The people in charge aren't doing the right thing. We just need to scrap the whole plan and start something different. Be careful. Be careful. God's instructions to a church haven't changed any. God's instructions to believers haven't changed any. God's instructions to Christians as ambassadors for Jesus Christ haven't changed. I I didn't read the Bible one day and then 2020 happened and I read the same page the the next day and it was, okay, well, we got to change all this. You know what this book did? It's timeless. The instructions before 2020 are still the instructions after it. The instructions for a church before are still the instructions after. And God may allow some things to just really throw a wrench in it. I mean, I hear hear Alan talking about missions. And the reality is, not just from the missionaries we support, but in general, probably, I don't want to say half, but in some cases, Half the missionaries that were in a foreign country can't get back to the foreign country. In some cases, I mean, it's it's just a a big number. And the Lord may be rearranging things. Obviously, he's allowing things to happen. But I just want you you and I to keep focused on what's what's at stake here. The Lord hasn't changed his, his 
program. The Lord hasn't changed his direction. The Lord hasn't changed his ideas. This stuff isn't a surprise to the Lord. He may fundamentally change some things by allowing what's, what's been allowed. But to come up with a solution like Israel did and say, hey, we'll just scrap the whole thing and do the whole thing different. That's not the way to do it. God set it up the way he, do, he, he, he wanted to. The scary thing is, when the nation said, give us something different, the Lord said, okay, I will give you something different. But it's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. And when you cry out because you regret asking for what you asked for, I'm not going to hear you anymore. That's scary. Be careful what you ask for. And not just be careful. That can be too, too vague. Be careful what you ask for. Remember, God's plan hasn't changed. It hasn't changed any. He said what he said about Christianity. He said what he said about church. He said what he said about Jesus Christ. And there are still sinners who need to get saved. There are still Christians who need to be edified. There are still, if you're saved, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And that hasn't changed a bit. So let's, let's keep focused Remember God's plan of attack. I mean, it hasn't, hasn't changed. Any. Be careful. Be careful. Because we are subject to do exactly what Israel did. Just forget what all we were doing in the past, and we're just going to take a whole new course of action. And then the Lord will allow that. But it may be, <laughs> it may be regrettable going in a different direction. So... I hope that is helpful to you. Let's have a little, uh, I tell you what, have a little time of invitation here. Just real, real briefly, as Sam plays a little bit on the piano, just reflect on this chapter, reflect on what happened with Israel, what they asked for, what they got, and the temptation to just do away with all the things God put in place before and try a whole new different route. As Sam plays, bow your heads, close your eyes. We'll have a little time of invitation here. You can sit in your seat there. Let's just reflect on this chapter. Because this chapter really does change the, change the history and the course of the nation. It really does.
God bless y'all for being here. Thank y'all for being here. And uh, just, just remember, I guess the theme of the whole thing is don't, don't let the pressure, don't let the pressure or make you make decisions that you're going to regret in the future. That's what Israel did. That's what Israel did. Sometimes the Lord answers those prayers. And uh, it wasn't good, though. But uh, the Lord hadn't changed. He hadn't changed his program. Hadn't changed his mind about things. Hadn't changed his mind about lost folks. Hadn't changed his mind about saved folks. Hadn't changed his mind about Jesus Christ. And uh, so let's just focus, press on, move forward, serve God. And uh, it is a blessing to see all of y'all here. It's a blessing to have y'all here. Blessing for those watching. And uh, it's good, been good to see new faces and visitors and things like that. It's been good to see new faces around here. And uh, I'm glad y'all are here. Well, Alan, how about you dismiss us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the blessing you've given us on our heart. May the Holy Spirit touch each and every soul here. Pray, Lord, that you bless everyone for being here.